travelled without their £400,000 striker Steve Torpy. He was ruled out with a knee injury. So Colin Cram returned to partner Sean Gota in attack. And Brian Tinian was declared fit after missing one game to return on the left of City's midfield. This report by Richard Latham. Winning without playing particularly well is often considered the hallmark of a promotion side. And City did just that at Brunton Park. After early Carlisle pressure, Colin Cram sounded a warning to homekeeper Tony Cade. Mickey Bell's free kicks have brought vital goals in an amazing sequence of results, but this time Cade wasn't troubled. When City took the lead on 19 minutes, it was down to another impressive contribution from Tigerish teenager Tommy Doherty. The little midfield dynamo left two Carlisle players floundering before producing a perfect through ball for Sean Gota. City's leading marksman thrives on such opportunities. Watch Gota look up and measure the options before a typically deadly finish. Carlisle appealed for offside, but Doherty's pass and Gota's run were perfectly timed. Now City were looking more like promotion material, with Greg Goodridge proving he can be an influence away from Ashton Gate. Adam Locke's pass and a clever ball from Cram gave Brian Tinian a clear opening. But there were still anxious moments for John Ward, who must have feared the worst when Locke brought down Nick Wright as he looked to be bearing down on goal. Referee Michael Pike from Barrow decided the tackle was just outside the area and Locke escaped with a caution. From the free kick, City's defending left a lot to be desired and Richard Prokash should have equalised. After the interval, City began to show their effectiveness playing on the break. Goodridge is determined to hold down a regular place and can threaten from any distance. Next, it was Bell's surging run from the back, paving the way for the second goal. When you're on a winning run, even opposition defenders seem intent on gifting the points. 13 goals now this season for Gota, and he won't score an easier one. All Bell's hard work seemed to have gone to waste when Graham Anthony's amazing blunder made it lucky 13 for the City striker. Doherty and Matt Hewlett are relishing being midfield partners and Jim Brennan, a half-time substitute for Tinian, is another rising City star. His perfect cutback saw Gota denied a hat-trick, but Goodridge made it 3-0. A timely strike from the skillful Barbadian, challenged by Ward to contribute more to away games. No doubt in Goodridge's popularity with City fans, for whom the long journey had proved well worthwhile. Again, Gota was a key figure, but afterwards he was the first to admit the emphatic scoreline had been a touch flattering. The result was what we uh, what we wanted uh, to, to carry on the run that we've got. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, they made it very difficult for us. Um, they were a very um, high pressure team in that they didn't allow us to get it down and, and play as we would li would have liked. Uh, but nevertheless, we, we seem to have just gotten uh, three chances, maybe four, and, and we happened to just put the three away. Well, the first half, I felt we were fortunate to go in a goal a goal up. I thought that uh, Carlisle deserved to at least be level, if not not beating us. And I thought our performance was a little bit slack in terms of how we performed in, in previous weeks. But the second half, particularly, I thought we tightened up and toughened up. And uh, we've always got players who can actually score. We've got some pace and then we can score on the break at times. And we did that in the second period. But you know, I'm not totally convinced with, it, with our 90 minutes. We've got Burnley at home in midweek, and then, uh, then we go to Bournemouth in the FA Cup, and then we go to Watford. So uh, if we could, we could maintain the win at least one more game and go into Watford with the top two sort of pushing on, then uh, that would be a good position for us. But Burnley will be a tough game. And no doubt about the form team, Bristol City went into the meeting against Burnley with 11 wins and a draw from their last 12 games. Ian Crocker reports from Ashton Gate. Watford may be the runaway leaders in Division 2, leaving the rest behind, but hang on, not quite the rest. 
There's one team they just can't get clear of. Bristol City went into battle with Burnley, seeking a record equaling ninth win on the spin. Not too much for the fans to complain about then, and just as well by the sound of it. Bristol City fans are pretty intolerant. Uh, you know, they expect to win and they expect to get promoted, and uh, I think John Ward's got the message now. It looks like we're going to make it this year, so keep our fingers crossed. But yeah, it's been brilliant so far. Nothing out there to challenge us at the moment, is there? Well, this man was about to try, and Chris Waddle's Burnley made a storming start. Bristol City was slow and sluggish, and an abrupt end to their winning ways looked likely after Paul Barnes' fine finish. But after a first half to forget, came a second half to remember. The boy from Barbados, Greg Goodridge, equalised. Colin Cram was brought down by Marlon Beresford. And Mickey Bell was spot on. City will need to sharpen their act for their next league match at Watford, but when you're winning and winning, you survive scares like this. And that ninth straight success was secured by Goodridge, striding through to score his second in style. I'm sure I've heard it said somewhere before, but this really was a game of two halves. Honest, a classic example of a dressing room dressing down that worked wonders. When we came in at half-time, it didn't look as if we were going to get anything from the game, let alone win it. So we, we had to really step up the game and sort of say one or two choice things to the players, which they accepted, and they were responsible for, for, for taking it on in the second half and, and getting that result. I thought the tempo, particularly in the second half, was, was the one that we, we try and require here at Ashton Gate as much as we can. I've never seen him that way before for all this season. And he had all rights to, because we didn't do what we were supposed to do in the first half. And he had the right to just come down and just chop the hammer down at halftime. Your halftime team talk wasn't a bad one tonight, was it? Uh, it was all right, but you can't have the tape. <laughs> <laughs> Join them for Watford against Bristol City. A much changed Watford side from the near reserve 11, which went out of the auto windscreen shield at Fulham in midweek. But former Nottingham Forest striker Jason Lee is one of the few names to remain. He's just back from injury and resumes a powerful front running partnership with Ronnie Rosenthal. Watford, beaten just once at home this season, are also strong at the back and can score goals from almost anywhere. Peter Kennedy has nine to his name. Although they suffered a set back in the FA Cup at Bournemouth last week. This Bristol City lineup can still point to an excellent recent run in the league with eight straight wins. And the midfield is strengthened today by the return after injury of both Tommy Doherty and Brian Tinian. The new signing Scott Murray can only find a place on the bench. Top scorer Sean Gota is up front and in the shop window now that he's on the transfer list. Bristol City then in change colours of all white who get this top of the table clash underway at Vicarage Road. Today's referee is Barry Knight who comes from Orpington in Kent. Graham Taylor of course a great personal friend of City boss John Ward and uh, in fact John Ward is staying at Graham Taylor's house overnight. Johnson angled ball looking for Rosenthal, Bell was alert to the danger. Taylor just helped the ball away from harm's way. Just occasionally Watford really do change the uh, pace of their attacks. It has caused Bristol City one or two alarms so far. Now it's a more measured builder. Lee to Gibbs. Deep cross to the far post. Lee. Well, he couldn't quite hook it towards target. Difficult ball for him to do anything with. Back to goal. Really wanted it in front of him. Rosenthal. Lee's touch was a disappointing one. Made scrapping away for Watford. So to Taylor for his team. Watford just building up ahead of steam themselves now. Lee goes to meet it. City backed off and uh, rather let him have a free header there, which is perhaps not the best tactic against six foot plus Jason Lee. Again, Doherty tumbles to the ground after a confrontation in midfield. Play continues though. Could work it through for Rosenthal. Bell's with him. 
Good defending by the City man. There were one or two anxious glances. Rosenthal looked as though he was hoping for a penalty kick in all that. Now Watford have men over. Good save by Welsh. It was Mooney's drive. Rosenthal, who came right across the goalkeeper at point-blank range. Welsh only had eyes for the ball and made sure it didn't pass. Now Cram for Bristol City at the other end, tried the delicate chip, and he'll maybe be wishing he'd opted for power instead. Every now and then, this sort of three-pronged Watford attack. Looks like it's about to break through. So far, City just managing to snuff out the danger. Again, a, an unfortunate ricochet. One or two fans in particular were claiming a back pass, but there's no way that was intentional from Carey. He was trying to hook the ball clear. Ball waiting in the middle for the cross. This is Edwards. Motor with his back to goal. Laid into the path of Bell. Well, it's on his weaker flank. I'm sure he'd have preferred that on his left side. Steve Palmer lining up a long throw. Cleared by Edwards, and on by Doherty. Nice touch by Cram for Gota, and Gota is away from his man. It's Sean Gota against the goalkeeper, and Sean Gota gives Bristol City the lead. And what about that for an answer to anybody who thought that Sean Gota wouldn't give it 100% now that he's turned down a new contract? It was the perfect counter-attack by Bristol City. Watford were caught short at the back, and Gota, quite frankly, skinned them. It's his 14th goal of the season, and maybe that will alert one or two to his availability. The more important thing for Bristol City, it puts them 1-0 up, and perhaps within touching distance of the leaders. Quickly back in action again. Rosenthal took it superbly. Mooney, brilliant challenge by Carey. That was a real lifesaver from the young defender because Mooney was about to pull the trigger. More pressure now on the Bristol City goal. Lee got ahead to it. Palmer with the shot that was deflected have gone anywhere it's gone for a corner and it's real helter skelter stuff for the moment Mooney to Johnson and Sean Goethe's goal has certainly lit the old touch paper here Lee turns away from Taylor and feeds Hyde lock in the middle with the vital touch for Bristol City. They really are at full stretch at the moment. Watford throwing everything forward. Great try by Palmer. Deflection, says the referee. That'll be a corner. Steve Palmer was uh, looking for something spectacular. And he very nearly pulled it out. Johnson feeds Rosenthal. Hyde to Lee. Taylor's gone down. No foul, says the referee. Lee didn't make the most of his opening. Looks rather ruefully towards the skies. It was a good chance. He was perhaps lucky to get away with the challenge on Taylor. He then blazed it high over the bar. Again, coming forward. Noel Williams. Deflection, goal for Watford. And it's the substitute, Gifton Noel Williams, who's worked the oracle as far as the home side were concerned. But in truth, there was a good deal of good fortune about the goal. 
Just a slight touch was all it needed to take the ball away from the despairing dive of Keith Welsh. And Watford are back in business just six minutes from the end. all over, all square at Vicarage Road, the old friends shake hands, they can uh, remain friends, they can talk to each other over dinner tonight, discuss the finer points of a game which has seen these two promotion chasing sides in a bit of a stalemate really, Sean Gota did give Bristol City the lead, they were within touching distance of all three points when six minutes from time, Watford substitute Gifton Noel Williams grabbed a precious equaliser. It means the final score here at Vicarage Road, Watford 1, Bristol City 1. OK, well, John Ward, uh, honours even at the end of the game. Do you think that was a fair result? Yeah, I can't deny Watford anything from the game. They've, they've powered back at us right the way through. I mean, we've, we've, we, we said to the team, stay in the game as long as you can. Uh, we stayed in for the first half, which I thought we did well to do that. Uh, we've got a goal, not pinched it, we've worked it, and it's a, it's a super run and finish by Sean. And then we said, right, we know this team won't roll over. They're going to come back and they're going to power at us. And I thought we held on extremely well until those last few minutes. But I can't deny Watford or Graham Taylor a result from the game. I think it's a, I think it's a good result for both teams. Yeah, Colin's done well. I think the ball's gone up to Colin Graham. He's, he's nicked it around the corner. Um, and as a result, he spun for the return and, and the defender thought I was actually going to return it to him. I've let it roll around uh, the other side of me and I've knocked it out my, my, my feet. And uh, I thought it was a bit too far, but having said that, it's encouraged to keep it to come out. And then he's thought, no, I can't get there. Uh, and from there, he's, he's made my mind up and I've just dinked it over him. On a personal note, Sean, how difficult a week has it been for you this week? Well, it's not been difficult at all, you know. You, you just uh, keep, you know, keep your feet on the ground and the gaffer, he's, he's not the type to, you know, blow things out of proportion and he's just telling you work hard and keep doing things. Um, and the minute you do, you know, think you're a bit too big for yourself, he, he puts you straight down and, you know, he's, he's told me just keep working at things and, and forget about all the off-field off, off field stuff and, and get on with it. And, um, you know, today today's uh, game was, was more about, you know, for Bristol City and, and you know, doing it for them. To being friends, if when you fall out, that's it. You know, uh, a true friend is someone that can tell you the truth, and it might hurt you, uh, but you stay friends. We made going into work or going into the ground a, a pleasurable experience, and people enjoyed looking forward to doing that. So there was a care from everybody, not just about whether the team won or lost, but but how we represented the football club and made it a very important part of our lives. John has now got an opportunity to take that club and build it in his own way and be successful with it. And the club that he's at at the present time is certainly capable of going into the Premiership. If anything, it's probably steeled him and toughened him up and he's going to show people wrong. And Hopefully we can both get promotion together, but if we can't, I hope Graham Taylor does. It's one of the game's genuine mutual appreciation societies. Fullback and striker, manager and coach, Graham Taylor and John Ward's relationship has adopted numerous guises, but Saturday was their first time in direct opposition as managers, 26 years after it all began. This is when I walked in the dressing room at Lincoln City as a player. Uh, Graham was also a player and as you walk in and say, this is your peg, John, and it was next to a man called Graham Taylor, who was the club captain and the left back at the time. And I think from that day on, a friendship developed. He was always a player and a person I could trust to talk to uh, and get good advice from. And that was 1971, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> he worked at his game. He was intelligent enough to know about uh, where to go for the ball, how to, to sort of come off strike, uh, to come off defenders. And he seemed to have that... Uh, ability to listen and learn. Is it Batson? Smith. Good goal! In 1975-76 season, we managed to win the fourth division championship and I finished up top goal scorer. So I, I think I repaid him for his faith in, in me in that respect. But I think from then on, we, 
we knew that we could rely on each other and I think that was very important in the friendship. He knew when to lose defenders, he knew when to make them and he knew to, how to get onto to the blind side of them. I like to think that a little bit of the coaching that we did helped him along the way, but he was a quick learner and uh, he did very, very well. He was a good goal scorer. The keen striker had showed even greater promise as a coach. By the early 80s, Ward was alongside his mentor as Watford had ventured into Europe and reached the FA Cup final. But nothing lasts forever. Very important for John to come to one degree out of my shadow. Uh, I've never wanted players that I've tried to help to stay in the game to become uh, a second Graham Taylor. I want them to be managers in their own right. The friendship survived not always because he's looked after me or I've looked after him. We've had, he's had to make decisions on me and I've made one or two with him that, that haven't been, been sort of together. So when Taylor left Aston Villa for England, Ward went on to mastermind his own campaigns at York City and Bristol Rovers. He's his own man, but you can detect Taylor-made signs in the body language, the schoolmasterly bearing and the honest straight talking. Substitute for Robinson, Easton and the lad Noel Williams. He's a big strong boy. OK, here you go, get on with it. It's your game. Good lads. I think we're both committed to our football clubs. I've been manager of three and I've been very committed to all three of them and, and worked very hard to try and, and make them as, as successful as I can. Uh, and Graham is exactly the same. And I think the, the dedication that he's shown in, in terms of how he's gone about his job, I think that in particular has rubbed off on me and that impressed me initially. You've got to have a commitment and you've got to have a cause. And if he develops that at Bristol City, then I think they'll have a good chance of going all the way, providing he's given that time. Saturday began with a quick handshake. Taylor and Ward have stretched their teams into such an embarrassing lead at the top of the second, it would be wrong to gloat. In just nine months, Ward has given Bristol City's ambitious chairman and huge support a championship-chasing team. His only problem right now is persuading top scorer Sean Gota to come off the transfer list and sign a new contract. Back on the bench after a year's sabbatical experience has curtailed Taylor's explosions of emotion, but not his eye for a lean and hungry talent. Gifton Noel Williams is rated Watford's best teenager since Taylor gave a debut to John Barnes. Just after coming on as sub and five minutes from the end, Noel Williams did what his elders had never looked like doing. There was a certain diplomacy about the draw, Ward didn't take it too well, but it takes both clubs away from a pack rapidly turning into also rants. And it increases the chances of a promotion double for the big rivals with the great friendship. Two words, he's top man. That's all he asked me for, two words, that's what he is. Phil Duffel. Bristol City are certainly homing in on success this season. They've now reeled off nine successive League and Cup wins here at Ashton Gate. A settled side and style of play has helped along the way. And there's only one change today, with Matt Hewlett returning to the heart of midfield after suspension. No change at the back because Sean Dyche has failed a fitness test, and so he won't play against his old club. FA Cup semi-finalists last season, there'll be no such distractions for this Chesterfield side following their exit at the hands of Grimsby in a second round replay. Manager John Duncan also makes one change, a straight swap up front with David Reeves replacing top scorer Roger Willis, who's on the bench. The Spireites are a good defensive unit and have conceded just one goal in the last six league matches. So it's visitors Chesterfield who get the game underway. Important clash at the top of Division 2. Chesterfield starting the game in fourth. Bristol City, the home side, of course, a second just behind leaders Watford. And in charge today, referee Andy Durso, who comes from Villaricky. Reeves and Williams are on the near post. So too Taylor for Bristol City, who concedes the first corner of the game. the near post area again City defending in strength shot cannoned off the bar I think it was Williams who just swung a boot at it and what a scare for the home team well, Bristol City concerned about defending the near post at that corner kick when the ball broke a ferocious shot which was past Welsh before he could blink and it smacked against the crossbar 
Holland. Gota, first sign of him so far today. And Fram had an option right, which was Goodridge. Didn't see him, but he's played an equally good ball for Tinian. That's looking for Greg Goodridge. What a shame. He was maybe caught in two minds. It really was a superb ball from Brian Tinian, inviting the strike from Goodridge, but perhaps he was trying to lay it back across the goal for a colleague. And in the end, the chance went begging. The ball just about found its way through to Locke. Goodridge, buzz around Ashton Gate as he takes on defenders and wins the corner. He really is a crowd pleaser, Greg Goodridge. Tinian again to deliver. This time it's Edwards flying in at speed. Gota takes it down. No room for the shot. He was being held back, and that's a penalty kick. One or two Chesterfield players have gone across to the referee to protest. Andy Derso's in no doubt. Gota certainly controlled it nicely first time. He was looking to perhaps get the shot in, and he was just held off the ball. Mickey Bell has already scored four penalties, all of them at Ashton Gate. That's number five as far as he's concerned from the spot, and Bristol City lead by a goal to nil. Just the start the home side wanted, and very coolly done. Once again, Bristol City build from the back. Bell to Tinian. Hewlett hasn't been spotted. Goodridge is in acres of space this side. Surely it could be two. Still Goodridge. Deflection. Keeper was already committed to the dive. And Greg Goodridge, well, perhaps... He should have made it too. Colin Cram to Goodridge. Great run. Shame about the control. He'll get a corner out of it, but it could have been so much better for Greg Goodridge. Brilliantly spotted by Colin Cram. A great run too from Goodridge. Tinian's corner. Edwards charging into it. Gota on the volley. Didn't get all of it. Edwards is still there. It may yet fall for Hewlett. I think it was Beaumont who just flung himself in the path of the shot. Hewlett certainly got plenty behind it. The end of a real scramble in the Chesterfield goal now. Cram headed the ball straight against Jules, but Goodridge showed quick feet to win it back. Gota makes his move. Goodridge's shot is deflected. And it's just over the bar. Quite a few in the crowd thought it was dropping in. Goodridge, on that occasion, unlucky. It was he who made the chance all of his own. And the deflection very nearly foxed the goalkeeper. Chesterfield moved the ball around nicely, though. Welsh has to come from goal to make the clearance. Goodridge makes his run, beautifully found by Gota. Goodridge is away, and would you believe it's not his day? Well, he was quiet for the first 15 minutes or so. He could have had a hat-trick in about the last five. That was the best chance of the lot. Second half so far hasn't quite lived up to the excitement of the first 45 minutes, but Bristol City can perhaps turn up the heat now. This is Hewlett looking for Gota, took it superbly. And howls for a second penalty. This time they're not answered. And I think Gota had just lost control of it. Otherwise, he might have stood a better chance. It was superb play initially. Just as he was bearing down on goal, the ball escaped Gota before the challenge came in. Maybe Bristol City may yet live to regret one or two of those missed chances in their first 45 minutes. This is Hewitt, carries header. It looked casual, but it was just good enough for Bell to complete the clearance. Still Chesterfield are pressing. Beaumont's shot is just over. And that really was a moment of concern for Keith Welsh. 
was sweetly struck by the midfielder and it was dipping all the time unfortunately for him not quite quickly enough Edwards too high for Gota Murray has continued the chase he's done well because he forced the mistake this is Gota for Hewlett quite break for the red shirts but Tinian has retrieved it swung over to Gota what a great try actually came back off the stanchion the two thought the ball was still in play but, uh, an acute angle for City's top gun but he wasn't afraid to try his luck and for some reason I think we were just a little bit off the pace today uh, but you know we'll, we'll take we'll take those and uh, you know, after the penalty went in, I thought we we played in fits and starts really, and uh, you know I think, like I say, I think we're a bit fortunate to come away with the uh, with the win. They always say that's a sign of a good side if you can play, you know, maybe not to potential and still take three points. It can't be bad. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we we went to Bournemouth uh, in the FA Cup and we played really well, and we didn't get the results. You know, so we we've not played so well today. We've won. We'll take those and uh, you know go into the, go into the next game. I'm sure we, you know we've got a lot more to to come out. We can get get a lot more play going in certain areas. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those days. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. City's biggest crowd of the season turned out on Boxing Day to witness their team's best performance of the campaign to date as they annihilated Millwall 4-1. The kickoff was put back 10 minutes to get them all in, but City wasted no time with Welsh international Rob Edwards testing Nigel Spink with this well-placed effort almost from the kickoff. On 10 minutes, the first goal arrived with Tinian picking out Nicky Bell on the left flank and Bell's cross requiring the deftest of touches from Colin Cram. Greg Goodridge had a belated Christmas present of his own for Millwall when he unwrapped a tremendous long throw just six minutes later, leaving Rob Edwards to nod it backwards over a stunned spin. A header that didn't escape the attention of Welsh manager Bobby Gould. 2-0 at half-time and Millwall did their best to get back into the game with a goal from Carl Wirt just eight minutes after the restart. But it was never going to be enough and when Brian Tinian unleashed a left-footed free kick minutes later, the Ashton Gate faithful knew for certain that it was going to be their day. To round off a superb victory, Sean Taylor converts a Tinian free kick which sees City 16 points clear of third place Oldham and leaves the players, the fans and particularly the manager absolutely delighted and looking forward to Fulham on Sunday. This was the fourth meeting of these clubs in a little over two months. After an FA Cup triumph and league double, City went into the game with the edge and yet they almost presented the visitors with a gift. Skipper Sean Taylor, a relieved man. But it took just 14 minutes for the home side to reinforce their recent dominance over the Londoners. Adam Locke scored his first goal in City colours in the league success at the Den, and he was back to haunt Millwall again. Allowed time and space in the box, his shot just squeezed past Nigel Spin. A Wembley finalist in this competition with Colchester last season, he's a player who obviously fancies a return trip to the Twin Towers. John Ward made several changes, among them the return of Gary Hours in midfield. Sidelined since October with a foot injury, he was raring to go and almost forced a way through the Millwall rearguard. Steve Torpy, another back in the picture, also denied. There'd hardly been a tackle in anger in a match played at a low tempo, but all that changed six minutes before the interval with a flare-up involving Brian Tinian and Millwall's Mark Bircham. The players were tangling initially before a head-to-head -head confrontation ended with the fullback lashing out at his opponent. Referee Mick Fletcher is a waste disposal officer but had a problem removing the Millwall man. Bircham, clearly angered by his dismissal, had to be restrained by several teammates before finally making his way from the field. And Millwall boss Billy Bonds later requested a videotape of the incident. A yellow card only for Tinian gave City the numerical advantage. And the midfielder almost made immediate use of the extra space afforded down the left flank but his fiercely struck shot was well blocked by the 39-year-old Spink. 
a European Cup winner with Aston Villa way back in 1982, his reflexes are clearly standing the test of time. City again went close in first half stoppage time after excellent approach play by Sean Gota, Torpy missed by the narrowest of margins. But watched by just two and a half thousand, the players were finding it hard going. How easy is it for you as players to motivate yourself for this competition? Because obviously the supporters don't take it this seriously this early on. Well, I think it was it was tough to be honest for all the lads. We come out here and seen the crowd, and to be honest, I think it was more like a friendly when you seen the crowd and then I think the lads did well just to get above the game and get the, the win in the next round. But as professionals, presumably at the end of the day, you'd like to play at Wembley in uh, April or May time if, if possible? Yeah, definitely. Well, the last time I went to Wembley, I went to watch Scotland and they could be by England, so I need to bench, hopefully and get in there and get a cup win, yeah. Certainly there was little by way of a roar from the Lions. Paul Wilkinson had their best chance after the break but his finish was both wasteful and woeful. By his very high standards, City's top gun Gota was having a quiet game, and even when the opportunity to make it goal number 15 for the season arrived, he couldn't make it count. If he wants to catch the eye of Premiership scouts, the Bermudan international needs to keep hitting the back of the net. After four games on the bench, newcomer Scott Murray was finally handed a starting role for City, and he was the next to draw another smart save from the ever-alert Spink. Five minutes later, the young Scott was at it again. After substitute Matt Hewlett's initial thrust was repelled, Murray seized on the ball and set off on another mazy run a la Greg Goodridge. All that was missing at the end of it was a debut goal to cap the moment. Fed up with a lack of first-team football at Villa Park, he's determined to make his mark at Ashton Gate. The margin of City's victory might have been wider, but Millwall's ten men battled tenaciously to the last. Their never-say-die attitude underlined by Scott Fitzgerald's goal-line clearance from Colin Cram. So, without ever making it into top gear, City's place in the next round was confirmed with win number four over the luckless Lions. Promotion remains City's major goal for 1998. This victory means they've also got at least one eye on a Wembley final as well. Yeah, I think, uh, to be honest, when they went down to 10 men, they seemed to battle a lot harder. They made it tough for us, and I think just in the end, we did well to get the win. But players here must feel like you've only got to turn up at Ashton Gate to win, because I've uh, made that yeah. 12, 12 wins in a row here. Yeah, it seems a bit of a fortress, but yeah, I hope we can keep it going and get promotion this season. Buckley, voted Manager of the Month for December, brought his informed Grimsby side to Ashton Gate threatening to close the gap Bristol City and Watford had opened up at the top of the table. Bristol City are looking to maintain a winning run here at Ashton Gate to stretch ahead of the chasing pack and close the three-point gap on leaders Watford. And there's a hat-trick of changes in this formation. Goodridge, Doherty and Cram returning to the side. Alan Buckley's team are the prime movers in Division 2. Next to bottom after five games, their passing style has now taken them up into fourth place. Grimsby also make three changes. Roger, Donovan and Livingston recall to their lineup. <laughs> Bristol City then who kick off in this important promotion clash where you feel something has to give. City having won 12 in a row at home and Grimsby are unbeaten in their last dozen League and Cup games. City on the attack early on, this is Goodridge with the cross, Cram's in there, what a start for Bristol City, 17 seconds are on the watch, and Colin Cram with a quite sensational opening goal. Well, what a start, one of the quickest goals of all time ever seen at Ashton Gate, brilliantly contrived with Goodridge's cross and Cram's execution and poor old Grimsby just don't know what's hit them. 
City lead 1-0, and is there any stopping them at Ashton Gate? Tinian with a lovely dummy, Crams flick on and he was fouled late, so Bristol City have a free kick. Brian Tinian's in charge of the kick. Taylor among those who've made their way forward from the back. It's aimed towards him, Taylor got there! It's 2-0 for Bristol City, and if they carry on at this rate, it's going to be a cricket score. Sheer delight for the home fans, and what a start. Perfect free kick, really. Tinian's delivery, Taylor's powerful header, no chance at all for the goalkeeper. Four minutes gone, Bristol City 2, Grimsby 0. You almost have to pitch yourself to believe it's true. This is Bell, hoping to pick out Gota. Good pressure by the home side. They really haven't given Grimsby a minute to compose themselves. Now it's Goodridge for Doherty. Edwards available if he wants. This is Cram. Now Goodridge, deflection took it over. Again, it was scintillating play in the build-up. The players are certainly enjoying it out there. Deep one this time. Gota brings it under control. Sean Gota. Great save by the keeper. On his near post, and no goalkeeper likes to be beaten in that area. It was well struck by Gota. Davidson plunged to his right to effect the stop. Gota sweeps it out to the ever willing Tinian. Cram begins his run. Tinian's just about found him. The keeper's in trouble. Colin Cram. Makes it three, and what a cool finish. And celebrated in style by fans and the player alike. Again, it was a breathtaking move. Tinian's early ball had Grimsby in trouble. Cram had time to take the keeper out of play and then thread the ball past the man on the line. It's 3-0 to the home team, and we haven't yet reached half-time. Dermot. Doherty again. Diving into the tackle. And there goes Gota. He's away from Lever. Can they start the second as they started the first? Yes, they can. This time it's taken them a long time. A minute. And Sean Gota gets his 15th of the season and surely wraps up the points already. Again, the Grimsby defence, all at sea, and Gota makes them pay. It could be a riot here at Ashton Gate. At the moment, it's four, but I'm running out of fingers. Bristol City fans, meanwhile, are going through their full repertoire of songs. The team defending, and Grimsby have one back against the run of play a ray of light for the Grimsby fans and even the City supporters are cheering that one corner kick played in I think it's Groves with the header in off the crossbar it's 4-1 well Colin uh, forgive me for asking this but what took you so long to get started today yeah it was a great start from the team uh, you know 14 seconds I think that's the quickest goal you know I've, I've ever scored and a lot of the lads were saying in, in that performance, that it's, it's the best, uh, it's the quickest goal that they've ever played in. Uh, I think it was 14 seconds. So you know, it was it was a great start. Uh, I think Brian Tinian played it to Greg Goodridge, and he stuck it in the box. And lucky enough, we've been there to put the ball away. It's the 13th win in a row here at Ashton Gate. But bearing in mind the quality of the opposition and the run that they were on, possibly the best of the lot. Yeah, definitely. You know, as I say, the manager's done brilliant. Uh, you know, it's, I think we went top of the league today, and you know, and that can only be good for Bristol City. Uh, we've been breathing down. Uh, Watford's next for the past two months, I think. Uh, you know, and it's it's what it's what what do we have for us today? It took City just 15 seconds to score against Grimsby last week. This week, it took them three minutes. 
Tommy Doherty with the header from Brian Tinian's corner. Wigan defender Roberto Martinez was on the line, but his header just helped the ball on its way. And it wasn't long before City made it too. The goal kick from Keith Welsh finding its way to Doherty. After some neat passing play from the City midfield, Bran Tinian picked out Colin Cram on the far side of the field. Wigan defender Colin Greenall committed himself and Cram was cleared to return the ball to Tinian for a great strike to make it 2-0 to City. A great way for City to get their 50th goal of the season. The first nationwide league team to reach the 50 mark, beating Peterborough to the record by just 22 minutes. And City could have made it three just a short time later. Tommy Doherty clearing the ball out of defence to Colin Cram who hit a great ball for Greg Goodridge to run on to. Goodridge rounded the keeper, but with just a defender to beat and Sean Gosa waiting in the middle, he pulled his shot wide of the post. In the second half, City had further chances. Cram putting the cross into Gosa, but he failed to get any power on his shot. But Wigan began to look livelier in this half and Keith Welsh had to make a fingertip save from Graham Jones's header. Welsh keeping City's two-goal lead and it didn't take long for them to seal the points with a third. Goethe's appeals for a penalty were turned down, but sloppy play from Wigan gave Tommy Doherty the chance to steal the ball. His cross picked out Colin Cram. Sean Goethe wrong-footing the defender to score his 16th goal of the season. It was another well-worked goal by City and manager John Ward will be particularly pleased with the style of this 3-0 victory. Looking forward to what they hope will be win number 14 on the trot. Late change of official today, the referee now is Mr David Hine from Worcester. away by Taylor, seized upon by Hunter for Northampton. Again, Taylor, the back man for City. Crown decides to switch the play intelligently. Hewlett on to Murray. Goodridge hugging the touchline should he need him. It's inviting the first-time cross. Goodridge jinks onto his left foot, back onto the right. The top of the crossbar, I'm not sure what the keeper was thinking of. Thumbs up from Greg Goodridge, who very nearly had his sixth goal of the season in rather strange circumstances. It was surely a cross, but it very nearly dropped into the net. Gota finds Cram, there's lots of space left side for Tinian. Bell's racing to get up alongside him. This is the full-back. Three red shirts in the middle. Deflection and tipped over by the keeper, who's taking no chances that time. Nearly caught out once earlier in the game. Mickey Bell's cross dipping viciously. Woodman helped it on its way over the top. Taylor has gone forward with this free kick, which Tinian will take. 
goalkeeper elects to punch, it's behind for a corner. Still Andy Woodman being troubled by the high ball into the penalty area. Doherty, good save. Had to react quickly. The header wasn't from too far out. And Andy Woodman plunged low to his right to smother the effort from Doherty. This is Murray for Bristol City. Brightwell's clearance straight to Gota. Now the defender's slipped. Still Gota towards Cram. Tinian! And forced in, is it by Hewlett? No! Well, they were all off the bench. There were one or two fans out of their seats, but somehow Northampton Town have survived a real scare. And Matt Hewlett must be wondering how he failed to force the ball home from no more than a yard out. Great first time ball, Doherty to Tinian. Nice dummy by Gota. Really positive stuff from the home team. Don't know what John Ward said at half time, but it was effective. Goodridge's cross, Cram back to goal, turned beautifully, unlucky. He couldn't really have had much idea of where the goal was, so quickly did he make the turn. Unfortunately for the Scot, his drive was straight into the keeper's midriff. Gale with a great effort. And it caught Welsh completely by surprise, caught us by surprise too. And luckily for the home side, the crossbar came to the rescue. This time Bristol City waiting for Taylor to make his move, but then it's short for Hewlett. Nearly worked. Bell sizing it up from distance, good tip over. I don't think the keeper saw that till late, to be fair to him. Struck with considerable venom by Mickey Bell. There's a bit of swerve on it too. And Andy Woodman did well to get his fingertips to it. Short for Bell. Cleared by Gale, only as far as Goodridge on the volley. Oh, flashed across the face of goal. Greg Goodridge hit the back of the net five times already this season, not too far away from number six. The goal Bristol City need just to break Northampton's resolve. Cam Sampson was sharply in with the challenge on Hewlett. Taylor equally so for Bristol City. Now Hewlett couldn't bring it down. That was a shame. He just gave Dizelle the time to make the challenge. Murray keeps the pressure on. Cram trying to make room for the shot. Still going, Colin Cram! Oh, the keeper just flung out a hand and took it away from Gota. And once again, Northampton survived by the skin of their teeth. Goodridge. Danger for Bristol City as they get too committed to attack. And now they could be struggling. This is Freestone. Dazelle's in the middle. Freestone goes alone. Good save by Keith Welsh. Difficult for a goalkeeper when he's had a relatively trouble-free afternoon to suddenly come out and make an important save. But Keith Welsh was up to the job. Gota feeds Cram. Two challenges. He is brought to ground by Warburton. Is this in range for the likes of Bell and Tinian? It's going to be Mickey Bell. It's desperately close. And it just wouldn't quite dip quickly enough for Bell, but certainly the keeper was struggling. Another small step rather than a giant stride towards promotion for Bristol City, despite Sean Gota's 17th goal of the season against Wrexham.
The Welshman hit back soon after the break. Neil Roberts ensuring a share of the spoils, though City remain 15 points clear of the chasing pack. First 45 minutes at Bloomfield Road produced few chances. Former City man Junior Bent, not renowned for his finishing, squandered Blackpool's best. Shortly after the break, some sloppy defending from the visitors allowed striker Andy Priest to give the small home crowd a much-needed tonic. But City, who'd beaten the Seasiders 2-0 back in August, were soon on level terms. First Tinian and then Gota denied before Matt Hewlett claimed a rare-headed goal. And the young midfielder appeared to have clinched victory when he scored again. City's 54th league goal of the season, making them the most prolific team in the country. But their hopes of closing the gap on leaders Watford to just one point were dashed by old boy Bent. This time, the winger got it right for an 88th-minute strike, which means it's three draws in a row for John Ward's men. Lewis Carey returned after missing the home defeat by Gillingham because of flu. He slotted into the centre of defence alongside Sean Taylor, which meant Rob Edwards moving into midfield in preference to Gary Hours. This report by Richard Latham. Loan signing Stig Johansson is still awaiting his first City goal, but looks lively enough to be a valuable addition to John Ward's squad. That early effort typical of another busy contribution. It was a match both teams thought they should have won, and Luton didn't play like a side a massive 28 points behind their lofty opponents. Chris Allen provided an early test for Keith Welsh. Johansson was proving elusive to Mark, and Rob Edwards' well-timed through ball almost gave the Norwegian an opening. Kelvin Davis to Luton's rescue. Greg Goodridge was well shackled for most of the match. But such was Luton's determination to close down on the winger's dribbling skills that space opened up for Brian Tinian to try his luck from long range. Luton were posing plenty of problems themselves, and now watch out for the sort of saving tackle that has made Lewis Carey such a key figure in City's season. Sean Evers, the man denied. Carey and Sean Taylor were outstanding on the day, and on the few occasions they were caught out, Welsh proved a sharp last line of defence. At the other end, much of the danger came from Johansson, who showed a touch of real class to bring the next save from Davis. Honours even at half-time and more chances for both teams after the break. He needed a typical intervention from the inspirational Taylor to keep out David Oldfield. Mickey Bell and Tinian have made the left flank of City's team one of their real strengths, and this interchange saw Bell break clear of the Luton defence. Sean Goethe almost adding to his 17 goals this season. But at times, City had to defend desperately. Taylor again coming to the rescue to stop Steve Davis's shot. That was only the beginning of a spell of Luton pressure that almost brought the breakthrough. There were strong appeals for a penalty as Adam Locke tangled with Oldfield, and then Bell and Matt Hewlett did well to avert further danger. If that penalty claim was somewhat tenuous, Luton looked to be very unlucky soon afterwards. Substitute Andy Fotiadis got the better of Carey and appeared to be pushed inside the box. Welsh saved well from Phil Gray and referee Ken Leach waved play on. City missed a couple of late chances, but a second look at this incident suggests they should be grateful for a point. City survived a few scares at York to close the gap at the top to just one point. Centre-back Lewis Carey's last gasp clearance and some sloppy finishing, making sure the home side drew a blank. A second-half penalty for this foul on Scott Murray allowed John Ward's side to claim their first win in seven games. Mickey Bell converting spot kick number six for the season. And with a little help from Rovers, City could go top this weekend.
approaching the final quarter of the season, Bristol City need only to hold their nerve to clinch automatic promotion. Though there have been signs of tension in a run which has delivered just one win in seven games. There are two changes from the team which won at York. It's crammed for the injured Gota up front, while Doherty's shaken off a virus to oust Hewlett from the midfield. Relegated last season, South End need the points to stave off the possibility of the double drop. At present, Alvin Martin's men are just one place off the bottom, and only by virtue of scoring more goals than Brentford. The Shrimpers have won their last two, but do change a winning side, with Rammel returning in attack and Gridlet strengthening the heart of this formation. So it's Southend who get the game underway in this meeting of two sides separated by 21 places and 31 points. It's an important time for City who meet Brentford here in midweek. Looks like they should bank six points, but it's not always as easy as that. Taking charge today, the referee Robert Stiles, who's from Waterlooville. Murray for Bristol City. He's got Jones for company, skipped past the challenge and uh, it was certainly late. Murray was gone and uh, Nathan Jones clearly clipped his opponent. The referee decides that'll be worthy of the first caution of the day. Good position this for Bristol City. Five men waiting on the edge of the penalty area as Tinian delivers. The keeper came but didn't really make it. And that'll be a corner. Simon Royce maybe just losing his bearings a little there. Taylor with a little touch. Doherty. Quite break for Murray on the edge of the box, but the ricochet off the referee was kind. Murray faced by two, gets his cross in. Well, disappointing there for Bristol City that no one attacked the near post. Murray surprised one or two by getting past the defensive cover and whipping the ball across. No one in a red shirt on the end of it. Doherty into the middle, Hales half clear. Torpy. For the turn, Doherty might, great strike, that's unlucky. Had to take it first time. Doherty, who's got one or two important goals for City this season. Lying up the bottom corner, struck it sweetly and only just wide. Doherty to Murray, a bit of room for him to work in. Dublin, the South End captain, is the player facing him. Murray's cross flashes over the six-yard box. Back in by Tinian, and Torpy's shot is shoveled round the post. Simon Royce takes a breather. Steve Torpy shakes his head. Good little move that initially with Murray's cross. Tinian returned it from a tight angle. Torpy was close. And launches it left side. Now, well, challenge in the box. Referee thinks twice, and he has to go in very quickly there. It was Nathan Jones, the player involved, and I think the suggestion was that he took a dive. Now, Jones has already been booked, and he's in trouble. It's a second yellow and a red card. Nathan Jones sent off for South End. In very strange circumstances, he was hoping for a penalty kick. The referee suggested it was a dive, and having booked the player earlier, had no option really but to send him from the field. What a disappointment for him, but what a chance now for Bristol City up against ten men for the remainder, and there's a good hour to go. Taylor aims for Torpy. Turn picks out Adam Locke. Four streaming forward into the box. Locke's cross is for Tinian. Now it's Murray. Crams there, 1 0. 
superbly carved out goal and brilliantly taken by Colin Cram. And he's got at least one friend in the crowd. Well, it was simple enough in the end. First time crisp into passing, which made the opening, and the header from Cram at point-blank range was simply unstoppable. It's his eighth of the season, it's a vital one for Bristol City, and they could be on the way to a very important win here against Lowly South End. Torpy plays it off the South End captain Dublin, it's behind for a corner kick. Tinian again will take it. Taylor on the near post. Here he is, he's beaten to it by Jobson, Cram and Edwards are also in there, the keeper's only half punch, lock! Great strike, how he would have uh, enjoyed that if it had dropped in against his old club. It was certainly dipping once Adam Locke hit it, but unfortunately not quite soon enough for him, he just cleared the crossbar. Three of the back four have gone forward as Clark takes the kick. Way by Taylor, Gridlet with a shot and blocked on the line. Really important stop by Murray. He was the saviour then for Bristol City because I think the shot was past Welsh. Scott Murray just stuck out a foot to rescue his colleagues. Murray attacking Dublin, looking to get to the byline. Still Murray. He'll settle for a corner. Positive play. Murray offered the short corner for a while, but Tinian delivers it long. Taylor gets there, off the post. Well, how close can you get for the City skipper? It's not away yet. Finally, the offside flag is raised. And that was a real scare for South End United. Sean Taylor finding room to get the header in. And missing by, well, no more than a coat of paint. Player should hail from sunnier climes. The Bermudan Leonardo Sean Gota, to give him his Sunday name, is Bristol City's top scorer, but the goals have suddenly dried up. As strikers do, you, you do go a couple of games without scoring, but uh, the gaffers encourage me to keep getting in those positions, and, and they'll come, and, and tonight it was. If we can get some goals out of him for these last ten games coming into the, the final push, then we'll all be delighted, and probably nobody more so than Sean himself. A slight back injury meant Gota started this one on the bench. He looked more in danger of a bout of writer's cramp as City threatened to overrun struggling Brentford. Scott Murray came closest to scoring, riding his luck before striking the inside of the post. It was a complete shock when Brentford took the lead. Derek Bryan scoring his first for the club since his move from Ryman's league side Hampton. Enter Gota for the second half, and his impact was instant. First, he set up Steve Torpy for the equaliser, much to Torpy's obvious delight. Ten minutes later, his physical presence forced Glenn Cockrell to head into his own net. And Gota should have made it three when referee Branwood waved play on as his assistant flagged. An amateur situation, really. Um, really silly of me to not just put the ball in the back of the net. Um, the ball's come, I've gone through, I've dinked it over the keepers, hit the post. Um, I, I'm thinking, you know, linesman's flagging. Um, and the referees give it, you know, play on, and a situation where I wish I'd have stuck it away. The miss was to prove costly. Substitute Kevin Rapley's acrobatics earned Brentford a point that they hardly deserved. When we look at the amount of uh, chances and pressure we had in the second half, uh, we like to look back at it and, and think that we should have won it, yeah. And now for Oldham on Friday. It's a big game for both of us. I mean, every game now for us is going to be big, but they'll, they'll want the three points at home to stay in and around contention themselves. There's, there's a lot of teams thinking that they can make these playoffs and, and push us still yet. So that'll be a tough game, and any team that Neil Warnock's in charge of will be strong physically and mentally, and, and we've got to go up there and match it, but I'm confident we can do that. That'll be cold as well. Well, it often is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit chilly here tonight, to be right, but yeah, it'll be a bit colder up there, I guess.